Hi. In the last video, I reviewed this UPO1204 oscilloscope from Unity, and I will provide a link in the cards so you can check it out if you haven't watched it. And in this video, I'm going to open it up and take a look inside. All right, let's take a look here. Now the positioning of the screws are definitely a little bit of unusual, and I think I'll have to remove these six screws. So let's uh, take a look here. Of course, once you open the case, the warranty will be voided, but who cares about the warranty anyway? So let's uh, continue with our assembly here. I'm not actually sure if these are the screws as, now these are probably screwed in onto that metal case inside. And well, once we uh, open it up, we'll figure out. And this, it feels like it's still being held back by something. Nope, actually you can see here, uh, I missed two screws. There are two hidden under this uh, handle here. So I have to remove those as well. Okay. And nope, those screws it turns out are not sufficient. As it turned out, you can see here, I just peeled this open, you can see we have an additional screw here. And in fact, there's an additional screw on the other side as well. So this is definitely not very friendly here. Let's uh, remove that screw so we can open it up. And this is definitely a little bit painful here. So on this side, I can already feel it. Yep, it's right here. So let's uh, peel it open here. Yep, as you can see, we have another. Ah, there's a hidden, by the look of it, some kind of a connector. Maybe it's a USB or HDMI, I don't know, but uh, certainly it's not offered in this model here. Okay, so now with all the screws removed, it turns out we have probably 10 of them. Oh, I think we should be able to open this up. Yep. And of course, as any quality scope, you get this very nice metal chassis here. So I have to further remove this. Give me one moment, please. And let me tell you, the chassis is very solidly built and there are certainly a lot of screws. There are quite a few on either side. You can see just to get to this point, we have already removed this many. But anyway, so I have also removed the shielding from the power supply so we can take a closer look here. By the look of it, it's actually rather simple power supply module here. This one, it seems we are only providing a single output and actually two outputs. One is plus 7.5 volts, the other is minus 7.5 volts. And by the way, as usual, I will put all the teardown pictures on my website and I will provide a link down below. So this is actually rather minimalist power supply and there's not too much to it. I can't really figure out the brand of this power supply and it wouldn't be surprising if Unity actually made it by themselves. And by the look of it, if you can see that the fan is plugged directly into one of the outputs from the power supply, it doesn't seem like it's temperature controlled. So this is why when we turn on the unit from the power supply in the back and the fan turns on immediately. And in my opinion, if they can make this fan temperature controlled and does not turn on automatically, that would be even quieter. But uh, the fan nevertheless is very, very quiet already. So not a big issue here. All right. I have to say this got to be one of the most involved teardowns I have done on this channel. As you can see here, I have taken so many screws out, the knobs and everything, but I still cannot remove this board from this case. And the problem right now I'm facing is you can see we have a cable and I will just gently pry it open as I don't want to damage anything here. There is a display cable on this side and I just can't figure out how to actually detach it because my finger doesn't go in and uh, certainly cannot reach that uh, tab. And then the cable is not long enough. And you can see here, the display is mounted right here. So I'm not sure how they did the assembly, 
but、uh, this is really a head scratcher as I cannot take anything out because of that. I had to remove all the other screws. So luckily, though, if you take a look underneath, I'm not sure if you can see. Let's try a different angle here. There's not a whole lot going on. Originally, I was hoping that the front end would have something on the back that I can show you. But right now, if you take a look here, ah, it goes back in again. Let's、uh, gently see. That's a problem. I cannot even push all the BNC connectors through without overextending that cable. So, not entirely sure how they did this before. Perhaps they have a special tool. I don't know. Unless I'm missing something obvious, but I don't think so. You can see here. This is clearly the furthest I can extend this board without breaking that cable. No,、nope, no luck here. My fingers are just too fat to get in there. I don't know. This is really strange, because that's the only thing preventing me from taking this board out. Anyway, so my point is, if you take a look at the back of the board here, and you don't see a whole lot. There's almost nothing on the backside, so、uh, even the front end is, I would say, there's some passives and perhaps a relay of some sort, and that's about it. And other than that, there's not a whole lot going on. And this side just, I no, I cannot push it any further without breaking that cable here. So、uh, yeah, if you know how this could potentially come out, leave in the comment below, and I will try my best. But Anyway, I'm not going to bother in this video, so I'll put it back and let's concentrate on what is on the back here. And here is a close-up of our input sections, and you can see that essentially the two sets are identical. That makes sense, as we have channel one and two, and channel three and four. And let me tell you this: so far, I'm really impressed with the build quality. Of course, it would be even nicer if it can be disassembled easier, but、uh, that's a totally different story. And if you take a look at the shielding cans, these are not just your typical very thin, flimsy shielding cans. These are very rigid, very high quality shielding cans, and they have these slots you can kind of slide it in to secure it onto the board. And underneath here, as you can see, that we have two sets, as we mentioned earlier, and these are identical. If you look at one of the channels, you will see we have some trim pots, some of the caps to adjust the input characteristics of each channel. So obviously, these are not electronically calibrated, but rather these are individually calibrated at the factory during the manufacturing process. For each of the channels, you have this solid-state relay. Then we have three additional relays. So these are for your range switching and AC-DC coupling. And on this side, the ICs, I don't see there are any special ones. These two are the LMH65. Now, interestingly, these two are identical in terms of the marking, but they are in different packaging size. I wonder why. These are high-speed op-amps, and the one next to that, that's a 4094. That's a shift register, so nothing special. Now, if you notice that we have two of these QFNs, so presumably one is for two channels, and these are LTC2620. These are octo 12-bit DAC. So my guess is that that deck is probably used to control both channels and used to set some programmable gains for the op-amps, and that is really it for the front end here. All right, let me move down. And in this section, we don't have a whole lot. You can see here we have some op-amps. These are the 071s, and we have a shift register here, and these are actually linear regulators. So nothing interesting here. And by the way, this is the connector going to the front panel via this ribbon cable. That is for your controls. So clearly, that's a serial protocol here, as we only have a few connectors. And I, of course, I will need to reconnect it a little bit later. And up here, we have another one of those. This one is a TPS 7A4501, which is a low dropout linear regulator. And these two chips here, if you look at the marking, let's just show you. These are Lindsay Semiconductor, and if you look at the part number, these are LS zero AD fifteen hundred. Now, interestingly enough, I think we see this before in our O one twenty two O two oscilloscope, the HDS series oscilloscope teardown. And this is an ADC, which is a 1.5 giga samples per second ADC. And my theory is that these two ADCs are interleaved and essentially shared by all four channels. That's how you get that、uh, sampling rate characteristics when two channels and four channels are enabled. 
if these ADCs are independent, for example, one for channel 1 and 2, the other for channel 3 and 4, then you would not have the effect of turning on channel 3 and 4 would impact the overall sampling rate of channel 1 and 2. And then here we have two of these DDR memory chips. And here, by the look of it, we have a MX6Y2CVM08AB, and that is an application processor with an ARM Cortex A9 core. Here, we have an additional DDR memory chip, and the chip up here, I'm not entirely sure what that is. That one has a marking of RCO820. It could be an application processor, or it could be a Ethernet controller. I'm not entirely sure. We have DC-DC converters all over the place here, and here are more DC-DC converters. So that is pretty much all there is on this board. And of course, we have quite a few programming headers for different devices on board here. And the chip in the middle, under that heatsink, that would be our FPGA. Now, I did see that this one has a lot of thermal grease on, so I'm not going to take it off as I don't have any thermal grease to reapply on the chip. So that pretty much wraps up this teardown. Now, I'm not going to bore you with reassembling everything back because there are just so many screws and it will take me a while. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Your participation makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching and I will catch up with you next time.